Hello, everyone. Dear PTTI and ITM conference attendees, it is my pleasure to introduce the PTTI keynote speaker, Professor Felicitas Arias. Dr. Arias received her PhD in astronomy from the Paris Observatory in 1990, and she worked as the director of Buenos Aires Naval Observatory from 91 to 99. From 99 to 2017, Dr. Arias worked as the director of the time department and the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, BIPM, and many of us got to know Felicitas well in this role. Currently, Dr. Arias is back and working at the Paris Observatory. Dr. Arias remained a professor at La Plata University in Argentina through her professional career. She directed many PhD and Master of Science students and postdoctoral fellows. Dr. Arias participated and led many scientific projects. Here are some of the major achievements. Dr. Arias developed the first connection between the extra galactic reference frame and the stellar Hipparchus catalog using radio stars. In 1994, the International Astronomical Union adopted the IERS Extragalactic Celestial Reference System that Dr. Arias developed as the International Celestial Reference System, ICRS. Dr. Arias led the inclusion of GLONASS into the computation of UTC. She was responsible for the creation of rapid UTC solution, UTCR. Dr. Arias led modernizing and expanding UTC calculations and time comparisons to include the newest constellations, measurement systems, and methods. Dr. Arias authored 128 peer-reviewed publications, including seven book chapters. With this superb background in frequency and time metrology and policy, Felicitas Arias will now will talk today about the future of SI second. Welcome, Felicitas. Thank you. So, so I was saying that, uh, thank you very much for this very nice introduction that uh, looks as a, a lot of work, but that means also a long time of my life working. So I am, I am pleased to be here and I am very happy for this invitation. Thank you very much to uh, the responsibles for uh, putting together a program for this meeting. And the proposal was excellent. Talking about why, how, and when redefining the SI second, which is uh, a hot topic uh, for time metrology today. So I will try to find answers to that, or at least approximation to the answers. We'll, we, if, if we talk about redefining a unit, we cannot avoid talking about the meter convention and explaining which are the ways to come to the redefinition or to the definition of a, of a unit. So I will start by that. Then I will take a case study, which is the unit of time. And I will explain how, uh, the unit of time evolved uh, in its definition and also in accuracy. I will talk about continuity, which is a requirement, a strict requirement when there is a change in the definition or in the realization of a unit. I will talk about the present status of uh, standards, of primary frequency standards and of secondary representations of the second. And then I will develop uh, what happens when we try to redefine a unit and in particular the SI second. So which are the motivations under which conditions we can arrive to a redefinition and I will guess on, on a timeline. And I will conclude by sharing with you some information that I received from the CCTF about the um, output of the last meeting of the CCTF concerning the redefinition of the second. So we will start by talking about uh, formal things. Uh, up. So 
I am blocked. So the formal things. The formal things start by the Mita Convention that was uh, signed, it's a diplomatic treaty which was signed in 1875 and started this very long coordination, international coordination for measurements. Uh, the Mita Convention created the BIPM, the Bureau International des Poids et Mesures, and also established that there is an international committee that will monitor the activities of the BIPM and will also make recommendations and propose resolutions to the General Conference for Weights and Measures concerning uh, the maintenance and the definition of the international system of units and other related um, uh, issues. This international committee cannot work alone because it is uh, composed by 18 personalities of the world of metrology. So uh, they uh, established consultative committees understanding in the different fields of, uh, of metrology. And in particular, uh, what is of interest this time, the consultative committee on time and frequency, the CCTF, which was previously the consultative committee for the definition of the second that we will find later in, in this presentation. But for redefining a unit, we need the relevant committee, but we also need the work of the consultative committee on units, which is specifically working on units. The General Conference uh, on Weights and Measures adopts resolutions, so if there is a redefinition of the second, the resolution will be made by the CGPM. And this conference meets every four years in uh, the proximity of, of Paris. So for redefining a unit of the SI, the first point is having a motivation. So what is leading us to think about a new definition of a unit? So we should have one motivation then we need a strategy uh, that is that the committee that understands on the technical aspects in our case the cctf and the committee which understand on units specifically the ccu will together put a strategy to come to a conclusion to come to a roadmap at the first uh, step and then to coordinate all the technical work. Uh, the activities happen in the National Meteorology Institutes that will perform the necessary measurements uh, at the BIPM because the BIPM is performing international comparisons and of course at the relevant committee that will follow, that will survey uh, the flowing of activities. Uh, after all that, recommendations will be put by the uh, relevant consultative committee and by the consultative committee for units. And then there will be a draft resolution, a resolution that, that will come from the CIPM and will be submitted to the general conference. And finally, in a meeting of the general conference, there will be approval hopefully, of the resolution. And this process is not short. This process takes something which is an order of 10 years. It depends. So which are the reasons uh, for defining a unit? Uh, I put three. One reason to think on the redefinition of a unit is if there are drawbacks in the current definition. So if we want to find examples, the meter and the kilogram have been redefined in the past because they were artifacts. So they changed, the meter was the first artifact that was eliminated from the SI and then the kilogram, which was uh, replaced by uh, a definition based on uh, a constant uh, two years ago. 
Another drawback is that the process of realization uh, of the unit is no more guaranteeing uniformity and as a consequence, accuracy uh, has a degradation. And we have an example in, in, in the time domain, the second, which was defined through Earth's rotation. It was redefined because there was no uniformity guaranteed and the accuracy was not good. Another issue could be uh, trying to seek global consistency in the SI. We know that today, as decided by the General Conference in 2018, um, the units are defined in terms of constant describing the natural world, which represent the best references. So having a unit which is not based on a constant is a lack of consistency of the SI. And the third possibility is that advancement in science and technology have overcome the current definition. That means that uh, higher accuracy is necessary to support demanding applications and that we have the way to satisfy those applications. And we have another example in the time uh, and frequency metrology, which are optical clocks. Optical clocks that can help to uh, go deeper in a lot of research. And for example, uh, I put an example here, refining the Earth model. So the question is why refining the SI second? If we think on the drawbacks, uh, of the current definition, uh, I would say no. I would say no because the second as defined today uh, has no lack of accuracy. I have again a problem with my PowerPoint. Okay, so if we look to this uh, blind uh, plot, the blue line and the blue squares represent cesium standards, and this is the evolution of the cesium standards. And the evolution of the cesium standards since the adoption of the atomic second 50 years ago until today <clears throat> shows that we don't have a degradation in accuracy. We started by a parts in 10 to the 11 in the 60s, and now we are in parts in 10 to the 16 today. So the cesium is not really uh, present presenting me is not a, a drawback. So this is not a reason. If we have a look on how the relative accuracy of the various definitions of the second evolved, uh, on the top, we have the second defined uh, by Earth's rotation, which was in the 50s, 60s, uh, realizing the second with an accuracy uh, of order 10 to the minus eight. Then we gain one order of magnitude and we made a jump, but we stayed in theory and observation. We stayed with a, the, the physical, the astronomical world. And uh, we used uh, the ephemeris second. We adopted the ephemeris second, which was based not on the rotation of the earth, but on the orbital motion of the earth around the sun. In the practice, it was not the sun, it was the moon that was, that was used for, for redefining exactly the practical, the practical case. And then what was unfortunate is that exactly when the ephemeris second was adopted as the SI second, the atomic cesium standards existed and were operational. But the decision was not made at that time. The decision came later and the adoption of the atomic second meant a big step in accuracy, a big step in accuracy that has gone down since then until now. And that marked the beginning of metrology in the definition of the time unit. So this is the situation. Second question. Uh, Shall we redefine the second or should we redefine the second because there is a problem 
with consistency with the SI as it is today? And I would say no, because if we think on the definition of, of the second today, we see that the second is defined on the basis of a constant of nature. So the constant of, of nature is the hyperfine transition frequency of the cesium atom. So it is perfectly consistent with the SI as today. Third question, is there any advancement in science and technology that overcame the current definition? That is, are we doing better than what we used to do? And the answer is yes, we are doing much better. We are doing much better because if we have a look again to this plot, which is no more blind, we find that this is showing the improvement in uncertainty of cesium. Cesium fountains arrive here. We are here today, but this is the dramatic much quicker improvement of the optical standards. So that means that now we are faced to a request. These optical standards exist. They are reaching uncertainties at a level of 10 to the minus 18 that will for sure, and we know, contribute to go deeper in the knowledge of the physical world so the answer is yes, this is a reason for redefining the second. And then we have a plot here that we will find later in this talk where we have a number of atomic species here, which are optical transitions that are already developed in uh, several institutes and that there are measurements and measurements published. And there is a microwave um, transition also, which is also uh, operational in, uh, in fountain clocks since uh, several years. So this is a reason for redefining the second. So we started by the second defined as a fraction of the solar day, and this uh, was observed from the fact that the length of day is changing. Then in 1956, uh, uh, the astronomers, the uh, International Astronomical Union made a decision and to correct the problems of non-uniformity coming from the Earth's rotation, they decided to adopt a new second which was based in the orbital motion of the Earth. And in 1960, I would say unexpectedly, the General Conference on Weights and Measures decide to redefine the second following the choice of the IAU. So it was the ephemeris second, the ephemeris second that didn't live long time because in 1967, it was replaced by the atomic definition. The point is continuity. Continuity means what to do when we redefine the unit in order uh, not to break the system. So if we go far in time, in, in the 19th century, in 1830, the metric system existed and the second was defined by astronomy. This was the first definition of the second, a definition based on the rotation of the Earth on the mean solar day that has never been adopted by the General Conference. Then uh, the CGS system appeared based on the centimeter, on the gram, and on the second. And after the signature of the meter convention, the CGPM adopted the MKS system, where the unit of time was the astronomical second. In 1960, the CGPM decided to change the definition to the ephemeris second, and the issue was continuity. So that continuity meant that it was necessary to know the exact equivalence between a second uh, based on the mean solar day and a second based in the length 
of a year. So numbers were made and when the numbers were made, something happened. It happens that the length of an ephemery second is not exactly equivalent to the length of a second derived from a mean solar day. There is a defect. And the defect is that the ephemery second is shorter than a mean solar day second. And it is shorter of a number which is 1.4 uh, 10 to the minus eight. And this is something we are still paying today. And I think that we will pay that longer. So in 1960, this was the decision of the CGPM. And eight years later, they made a different decision. They decided to change and to adopt the atomic second. So the issue of continuity was still present. And it was more complex than the previous change because we were changing from a second defined from theory and observation to a second coming from a completely different phenomena. The atomic second was based on experimental physics. So there was a point to solve how to link them. So the idea was that linking two stable clocks independently to the same phenomena was uh, a good idea. So these, uh, these clocks were going to uh, observe or to measure an event in the two kinds of time, one which was atomic time and another which was the time uh, which corresponded to the previous definition, and then comparing their output frequencies. But the question was how stable should be the clocks and how to deal for having frequency and time comparisons in very long distances, because the experiment was run between UK and between the US. The actors of that comparison were uh, Essen and Pari with the uh, cesium clock, uh, astronomers in the United States Naval Observatory, and the communication was possible by using radio signals from uh, stations, from Earth stations, such as the rugby station in, uh, in the UK and the equivalent stations in the US. And this could be done. So we can, uh, we can think if there was at that time a roadmap. Uh, was there a roadmap at, at, at that epoch for the redefinition of the second? Uh, I am not sure that they had a roadmap because I think that roadmaps are uh, uh, things we are doing today. But we, we can reconstruct a roadmap and if we compare this roadmap maybe with the one we will have for the next redefinition, we will see that there are very similar things. So I put at the first point of the roadmap uh, an event that was really surprising. I mean, not surprising here, but surprising a little bit late, later. Uh, the IEU General Assembly in Dublin makes a decision and adopts the ephemery second. And this was in 1955. This was at the same time that the ASN standard, the atomic cesium standard was in operation. So there was in the air this feeling that the second should no more be originated uh, in the motions of the earth. In 1956, the CIPM decided to establish a new committee, the Consultative Committee for the Definition of the Second, because this idea was in the air. And also in that period, commercial atomic clocks started uh, in the USA, the atomicrons, which had an uncertainty of parts in 10 to the 10. And in 1957, one year after, everything was very quickly, there was the publication of the measurements of uh, the 
atomic clock by Essen and Parry. So the atomic clock was officially presented in 1957. Between 58 and 59, there were atomicrons. And at that moment, there was the experience that Essen Parry Markovitz made between the UK and the US. And uh, it was also the starting of clock air transportation. They started transporting clocks for making comparisons. And Markovitz, who was an astronomer at the US Naval Observatory, uh, developed the methods, the astronomical methods, to be able to compare an ephemeris, ephemeris time with atomic time. And the publication of a value of the equivalence between the both seconds was um, near uh, 1959, and the value that Markovitz published was very close to the final value we have now in the definition. So one year after, there were atomic runs in many countries of, 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 of the Europe and in the US. And the curious event is that in 1960, the General Conference uh, decides to confirm the decision of the IAU. And they adopt the ephemeris second as the SI unit of time. So I suppose that many people in this quest of accuracy were really deceived. But one year later, the CIPM starts by accepting that the atomic clock is a clock. So they start thinking that methods could change. In 1963, the CIPM recommends the NPL value for the time unit and later on gives powers to the CIPM to investigate atomic and molecular standards. And finally, with a lot of discussion, the 13th CGPM decided to redefine the second and to adopt the atomic second. I think that all these years, there was a, an enormous lose of time almost for nothing, but there was, the idea was not mature in, 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 in the heads of, uh, of people. So in 1972, uh, the consultative committee for the definition of the second defined international atomic time. So the time scale that was based on the atomic second. And what is very curious is that 50 years uh, after that event, the general conference adopted formally a resolution defining TAI and UTC, but this is anecdotic. How to redefine the second? But clearly the, the second, if we will redefine it, will be based on the frequencies of the optical standards that are measured uh, since, uh, I would say more than 10 years in, uh, in NMIs. So there is a list uh, which is called the CIPM list of frequencies recommended as secondary representations of the second. This list um, is born at the CCTF. There is a special working group that uh, analyzes uh, uh, the, the proposals from laboratories and uh, decides on which uh, transitions go in this, in this list. So which are the current resources we have today? All type of resources. We have clocks in TAI, cesium clocks and hydrogen masers that give the stability to the reference scale. Uh, there are primary frequency standards and the number of cesium fountains today is 12 with uncertainties at the level of 10 to the minus 16 that regular contribute to TAI and make TAI accurate. We have secondary representations of the second with uncertainties in the low 10 to the minus 18. 
And uh, there are optical standards and one rubidium microwave standard reported in BIPM circular T more or less regularly. And concerning clock comparisons, we have satellite methods for comparing clocks, GPS to weigh, uh, optical fibers that are used to compare these uh, very accurate uh, standards, but also some links in, in TAI. Good news, good news uh, are, for example, that uh, in 2020, there was a publication on uh, direct uh, comparison of European primary standards and secondary frequency standards via broadband two-way and GPS PPP. And that the result of that comparison indicates that optical clocks can be compared with uncertainties in the range of a few parts in 10 to the 16. And that uh, this is not the end of the work because we need to, to do even better. We, we need to do better than that. And that promising uh, uh, methods could be using uh, the two way, but not with the SART uh, a classical model, but, but using a, a software defined radio receiver or GPS with integer ambiguity resolution. And on that, we have also good news and is that since 2020, there is one link in TAI using an SDR. It is the link between PTB and OP with the advantage of reducing the noise which is uh, affecting the, the two-way two measurements. So who, which, which are the motivations to redefine the second? For industry and society, the present definition uh, is enough. So it is not necessary for industry and for society. However, science needs a redefinition of the second because uh, there is a, a a need of more accurate frequencies, and this need can be satisfied with what today are the, repre the secondary representations of the second. And of course, for time scales, it is interesting to have a better, uh, a better definition because this could contribute to the improvement uh, of time scales, provided that some conditions are fulfilled. So. If we think about the frequency standards, what would we pretend to have optical clocks with demonstrated, validated uncertainty about two orders of magnitude better than cesium? Uh, we would like to have independent measurements of the same optical clock in different institutes. We would like to have ratios between optical frequency standards measured independently and agreeing in their values. Uh, concerning the continuity with the present definition, uh, we want to have independent measurements uh, of optical standards with respect to cesium primary standards. And concerning the intervals of, op of operation of optical standards, as we did with the cesium fountains, uh, ideally, they should contribute to TAI, and for that, there is it is necessary to have regular reports of at least 10-day intervals submitted to the BIPM. Uh, if we have a look to the comparison of, of these standards, we can say that today we are not exactly where we want, because this is the limit of the present space comparison techniques. With uh, optic fiber, we can compare the optical clocks without losing accuracy. But the point is that uh, that limits the comparisons to the distances we can cover with, opt with, with optic fiber. However, as I said, now there is this possibility of using two-way GPS PPP uh, broadband two-way. If there is an SGR, this will improve the situation. So we need still to do some work for the comparison of these standards. If we have a look 
to this to this plot this plot uh, was prepared by the um, the working group of, of the CCTF for a publication in 2017. Uh, the blue dots are the, the optical clocks which are uh, presently uh, operational. The uh, black lines uh, indicate which are the frequency measurements published and the number of uh, of uh, measurements is uh, is also in black, so there is a good number of measurements of frequency of these new clocks with respect to cesium. So we can say that one of the conditions is rather good fulfilled. Then there are ratios that have been measured and they are indicated with the blue lines and the numbers are indicating the number of ratios which has been which have been independently calculated so we are not far from having what we expect and then in red there are the unpublished values that are certainly uh, published today if we want to predict a timeline it is not easy to predict the timeline, but uh, let's see what, what happens. Concerning uh, the uncertainties to orders of magnitude better than cesium um, expected for at least three clocks, I think that we are there, completely there. So uh, uh, we are here in the timeline, so it's okay. Uh, independent measurements in different institutes of the same optical uh, frequency compared. Yes, we have. So 2020, we are ready. Continuity with the present definition, independent measurements with respect three independent cesium uh, fountains. We are there. So 2020 is a good moment. A regular contribution to TAI, uh, we are not completely there. They, they, there are, um, I think that there are strontium and iter iterbium clocks in, in, in TAI. The contributions are not absolutely regular. Only the rubidium microwave standard is regularly contributing to TAI. So we need to do some work on that aspect. For the frequencies ratios, we are almost there. There are many frequency ratios computed. We need to be able to have the same ratio repeated by a minimum number of laboratories and having them in agreement, but we are on the way. And then it will be necessary to validate uh, all the numbers and make a decision for an optical standard or for another way of redefining the second, maybe uh, having a combination of frequencies or who knows. So I will go quickly through the conclusions. Uh, the accuracy of the realization of the second by cesium as we uh, have it today has an increase of five orders of magnitude in 50 years. We are not unsatisfied. The relative frequency uncertainty of optical clocks is today uh, of order 10 to the minus 18. We are satisfied. Optical standards can be compared without losing accuracy with fiber optics. This is true. Work is ongoing for long distance optical clock comparisons. A few optical transitions are reported to TAI more or less regularly. So uh, some acceleration will be necessary. The CCU, the Consultative Committee for Unity, Units, um, established a strategy working group and discussions are ongoing on uh, the redefinition. The CCTF took actions to update the roadmap for the redefinition of the SI second. And this is just a uh, 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 possibility. If conditions are fulfilled, the CGPM could adopt a new definition by 2026, 2030. Uh, let's go to the CCTF. The CCTF put a recommendation in 2017 
concerning um, uh, the, the operation comparison and report of frequency standards, uh, which are secondary representations of the second in preparation for the redefinition. So uh, this is ETF request that institutes make efforts to routinely contribute to TAI with uh, measurements of optical frequency standards. Second thing is that the comparison of these frequency standards be made with uncertainties that are comparable to the estimated uncertainties of the standards themselves. Third point is that uh, the measurements of the frequencies of the uh, SRS with respect to the best primary cesium standards are necessary because they will provide the continuity uh, between the two definitions. And then the CCTF is requesting the same CCTF to put working groups to conclude uh, listing the milestones for a redefinition of the second. So I received some, uh, some um, information from Patricia Tabela and from Noel Dimarc. Uh, uh, Noel is the present uh, president of the CCTF and Patricia is running the time department and also the executive secretary of the CCTF. And um, the information I want to, to convey you is that the CCTF is concentrated today on hot topics that have impact on time and frequency metrology, on related research activity, and on everyday timekeeping accomplishments. And one of the four hot topics is updating the roadmap for the redefinition of the second. For doing that, uh, the CCTF created a task force on updating the roadmap and um, made a series of, of questions and uh, divided these questions to subgroups to uh, work on that questions, uh, just to, to mention the questions uh, for whom and why we want to redefine. So this is in a way which are the motivations, uh, which are the applications, uh, which are our current clock capabilities. So there is a need to know where we are today, which is the status and the evolution of optical frequency standards, uh, which will be the availability of commercial optical clocks. This is important for the laboratory work in the future, which are the possible options for a redefinition, one multiple transition, a more fundamental definition. Um, there is a question on the capacity to compare clocks and disseminate the second at 10 to the minus eight. Can we measure the geopotential at 10 to the minus eight? and which is the capacity to include optical standards to realize a time scale. So a lot of questions that this task force, which is divided in three subgroups, will have to answer. And the idea is to draft a roadmap for the redefinition that will be submitted to the General Conference uh, on Weights and Measures in 2022. So this is the end of my, of my talk. And I would like to close this talk with a thought uh, for, for scientists that were at the very, very beginning of this quest for accuracy. Norman Ramsey, Louis Ezen, Jack Parry, and William Markovitz. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, questions for Dr. Arias can be put in the Q&A channel. If you click on the Q&A button in your Zoom uh, button and we will bring those questions and address those with her. So we have a question here uh, from Daphna Enzer. It says, can you expand on your discussion of why space comparison techniques 
are limited to 1E-16 and how SDR and or IPPP improve on that? Uh, that's a long, <laughs> that's a very long question. So uh, why the present techniques are limited to uh, 10 to the 16 accuracy, uh, the problem is noise. So uh, if you think about two-way, for example, uh, the noise in, in the two-way uh, comparisons uh, is not completely, uh, the origin of that noise is not completely known. So uh, it may come from the modem, it may come from um, the traffic in the, in, in, in the satellite. Uh, what we have uh, concluded is that when you change the present model, which is the Sartre model used in all two-way uh, comparisons, there is an improvement of that noise. So uh, this is why the, the, the SDR, the software radio defined modem is a good possibility. It is uh, already, it has been proved. A publication will be uh, submitted soon on, uh, on, on that subject. Uh, concerning uh, GPS uh, PPP, uh, G GPS uh, has a better uh, uncertainty, uh, statistical uncertainty, uh, better than than two way because it has it doesn't have this perturbation uh, of, of the of the two way noise uh, and uh, the limitation of of the GPS phase can be uh, can, can be um, avoided or can be improved with this interambiguity resolution. But I mean, uh, the explanation is, is, uh, is rather long here and there is literature that, uh, that uh, we, we can find for explaining uh, that. I, I can then provide the, the, the information on, on, on literature to uh, the person having asked the question. Thank you for that. Uh, we do have one additional question uh, from uh, Dr. Kim. It says, would, uh, please comment on clock comparison over an intercontinental fiber. I mean, uh, clock connection over intercontinental fiber uh, is difficult. It is not impossible. So there are some fibers, some intercontinental fibers, but the problem with that fibers are the amplifiers. So it is, it is, not, so, it is not so easy to come to this kind of long distance connections. One case is being able to compare clocks by fiber uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, for example. The fibers exist, but the difficulties is technically to implement the fibers with the amplifiers apt for, uh, for these kind of comparisons. One example of intercontinental fiber, it is not intercontinental because the United Kingdom is in Europe, but there is, a, I mean, it's a different kind of, of, of fiber. Uh, it is fiber coming from the island to the continent. And this short, uh, intercontinental, if we can say, connection exists. The problem is the long, the long fibers over uh, the Atlantic. Uh, it's a technology, it's a technology issue at, at, the press, at present. But there are uh, good perspectives for the long distance comparison over the ocean. Uh, there was a workshop at the BIPM uh, in 2017. I was still at the BIPM. And the workshop um, uh, had the aim of prospecting uh, nouvelle techniques. And for example, one, one idea which is difficult to implement, but which has been 
tested in, uh, in some opportunities is using interferometry, very, base, very long baseline interferometry for comparing uh, clocks over the continents, such as astronomers are, are doing for extragalactic sources, for example. So that's, that could be a, a possibility, but very difficult to, uh, to achieve technically. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, one other question from Gunter, would the use of other GNSS uh, systems help in addition? Uh, the use of other systems help because something that we aim at doing uh, when we are talking about multi GNSS time comparisons is not to use many systems independently, but being able to come to a unique solution using all systems together. So if this is the case, this redundancy of satellites could help. But again, it is necessary to solve many problems coming from biases. I mean, it is not a straightforward solution. It is not something we will have very soon. We are making multi-constellation comparisons, but we are not using uh, systems together. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Patrick Bertaud is by redefining the SI second, leaving the cesium definition, what could be the impact on users, telecom, and cesium clock manufacturers uh, in particular, would a cesium clock be considered a secondary standard, yeah. but still applicable? Yes, of course. I mean, now we have a primary definition through the uh, cesium, and we have secondary representations through uh, the optical, through the validated optical optical uh, frequencies. So in the future, the situation will be that cesium will be one of those secondary uh, representations. We don't know exactly, we don't know, we absolutely don't know what kind of definition will be adopted. If there is a definition adopted on one specific transition, the other transitions, I assume, will be secondary. I, I am not preferring any transition. Let's suppose that the second is defined uh, using etabium. So all the other transitions will be secondary and the cesium included. For sure, redefining the second, uh, the first point is redefining. So we redefine if we are able to realize. So definition and realization. And then redefining the second implies that there will be a long-term work in the national institutes that are keeping time to adapt to the new definition. So those that run on cesium will continue running on cesium until the moment when they will be able to commute to the new realization or not. Uh, running on cesium will remain possible, I suppose, and I hope. So I don't think that there is a negative perspective for uh, industry fabricating uh, cesium standards or laboratories developing cesium fountains. I, I don't think so. The application will, will still be there. And for, for some applications in, in industry, I don't think that it, it will make a strong difference being on cesium, which will be secondary or being on whatever uh, transition will be adopted. This is my feeling, I think this is uh, how the things uh, I assume will evolve. Okay, thank you. We have time for one final question from Demetrius Matsakis. 
He says, another practical problem is irre irreconcilable differences between time transfer techniques. Do they exist? The example of the PTP-OP link whose two-way satellite time frequency and GPS links drifted at a rate of roughly one nanosecond per year over many years. Is there a resolution on that? Also, there are other examples on internal networks, but maybe that's only the case on a TAI link. Uh, I am no more at the BIPM. <laughs> so since I am no more at the BIPM and no more responsible for for time at the BIPM, I cannot give an exact answer to, to that question. But these are things we need uh, certainly to, to solve. Inconsistencies between uh, time transfer techniques on the same link, of course, are to, be, uh, are to be analyzed. I agree with Demetrios, but I cannot, I cannot give the answer right now since I am not aware exactly of how the things have evolved in the, in the last three years. Okay, hey, well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And if you have any additional questions, uh, you can, of course, uh, contact uh, our presenter through yes. the virtual attendee portal and uh, or by email. Uh, but thank you for your time today and for being with us. Uh, thank you for this invitation and thank you for the attention to this uh, conference.